who here has, uh, has, has anybody heard the term Top Gun? Okay, you know what Top Gun is? Top Gun was a uh, Navy, an actual Navy fighter squadron. It was a uh, movie that came out in 1986 also. Has, has anyone seen it? Is it? Okay, good. But the movie was based on the real squadron, and the squadron started in 1969, and when I was a Navy lieutenant, a fairly junior officer, I was an instructor at the Top Gun School. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is my experiences in the F-14, flying in the F-14 uh, before that, then what it took to step up and be an instructor at Top Gun, what it was like to be there, and a little bit about making the movie. So for me, my dream of uh, aviation, of flying jets, started uh, when I was around 10 years old. And of course, at that point, as a youngster, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So I went to college, that's a requirement to uh, become a pilot in the US services. And uh, when I was at college, my eyesight went bad. You can, this was in the, the late 70s, before the days of LASIK and PRK, and you had to have 20-20 vision to be a pilot. So rather than give up that dream of flying, I looked at my options and the Navy was introducing this brand new airplane, the F-14, that had a pilot in the front and a guy in the back called the Radar Intercept Officer, or RIO. So I just shifted my goal from being a pilot to being a RIO in the F-14. Even though the RIO did not have to have 20-20 vision, the, the program uh, was still very selective, very demanding, and so I had to request this, I had to earn selection, I went to flight school, and uh, it was still very challenging, but also, as I was gonna find out, it was very rewarding. When I graduated from college, I uh, waited a couple of weeks, and I went right down to Pensacola and began my training. Uh, I showed up there in 1979. So the planes that we flew up at the top was the uh, T-2 Buckeye, the T-39, and then the TA-4 Skyhawk. One thing about training is when you walk in, the, the first things are classroom activities and you had to do a lot of memorization. It's very intimidating. But I sat there and I said, you know what? A lot of people have done this before, so I'm sure I can do it. And this was one of the themes that I encountered repeatedly throughout my, my flying experience. I was not the first person to do most of this stuff. And so even though it looks hard, you just apply yourself you do the practice, you, uh, you listen to the people that are teaching you, and you can probably get through it. On my very first training flight in the Navy, in the T-2 up there, I got air sick. And so I'm thinking, is this, really, is this really good for a guy that wants to spend his career in dynamic dogfighting environment? But luckily, when I got back, I talked to my advisor about it, and he said, you know what? A certain number of guys do get airsick. A lot of guys, in fact, on their first flight, they go, if you can work through it, if, uh, if you still are committed to the program, then we'll keep working with you. And so after just a few flights, I started to get a lot better. I started to feel more comfortable. I started to get used to the, uh, the maneuvering, and air sickness uh, became, uh, you know, was, was a non-issue. But once again, one of the reasons I mention that is that there's obstacles that you have to overcome to get to, to, these, uh, to get to these accomplishments. I trained in Pensacola for almost one year. Then I went to F-14 training in San Diego for about nine more months, and in 1981, I joined my first real fighter squadron, the Fighting Renegades of VF-24. That was our call sign, the Fighting Renegades. We we're flying the F-14A Tomcat. This picture shows uh, most of our squadron jets lined up on the uh, flight line. The F-14 was a big airplane. It was more than 60 feet long. When it was empty, it weighed about 42,000 pounds, 21 tons. And when it was loaded with fuel and missiles, it could weigh almost 70,000 pounds at maximum weight. So it was big, but it was sleek. As you can see, it was powerful. And at the time when I joined the squadron, 1981, it was still in production. I mean, it was still very hot, very contemporary. A squadron itself consists of about, uh, at the time, it was 10 to 12 airplanes, depending on what phase of their training, had about 200 enlisted personnel and about 30, 35 officers. 
So that's what the name of the, or that's the size of the squadron organization. The F-14 had two missions. The first mission, which was actually its priority at the time, was to be the Navy's fighter airplane. That is, it would sweep the enemy skies of airplanes in terms of combat operations. It would escort bombers, Navy bombers, and protect them from enemy fighters. It was a traditional fighter mission. The second mission is one that a lot of people think of. It was defending the fleet against raids by hostile aircraft. And at the time, this consisted, or the biggest, the highest level threat was the Soviet bomber threat. Soviet bombers of cruise missiles escorted by jammers, very challenging problem. And so the F-14 had a lot of capabilities so it could perform both of these missions. Our flying training at the time consisted of training for both of these missions. We were based at Miramar down here in San Diego. Great place to live, great place to operate out of. We did a lot of our training off the coast in that area called W-291, which we called Whiskey 291. The next uh, most common place we trained was out over the desert, R-2301 West, which was near Yuma, Arizona. Sometimes we went to China Lake, California, in uh, Southern California, and other times we went up to the Naval Air Station, or NAS, at Fallon, Nevada. And each of these locations had uh, pros and cons. For example, off the coast was the most convenient, easiest to get to, but then if we went a few miles further over to Yuma, we had more realistic training because we were flying over land bases and we had the incredible instrumentation of the tax range. The F-14 itself was an agile airplane, especially considering that its size, considering its size. The type of training flights that I liked the most were the dogfight training. Even though I was a Rio flying in the back seat, I love flying a fighter. I love the maneuvering, the dynamic environment of dogfights. Now, uh, now that I'm in a squadron, I'm starting to get a real understanding of what the F-14's mission is, or, or excuse me, of what my role as a Rio was. In the front seat, you got the pilot. He's got the stick, throttles, rudder pedals, he's flying the airplane. The pilot also had a lot of essential controls, but he was focused on flying the plane and the Navy did a good job of dividing the crew responsibilities. So I'm sitting in the back seat and this is a selfie. We didn't call them selfies back then, but we still took them, you know. This is me in the back seat of an F-14 and I had several, several duties. I was, uh, I was res assigned responsibility for communication and navigation. Now the pilot was capable of doing that stuff, but since we had two guys in the plane, the Navy was very good about cockpit resource management. And so I handled communication and navigation. I also did co-pilot duties. For example, I backed them up on uh, aircraft fuel, altitude, things like that, and I initiated checklists. Now, of course, my main duty was operating the weapon system. When the F-14 was built, they could not automate a lot of radar functions, so I had a, a panel of radar controls, uh, switches, and things like that. And the training teaches you to operate these things, but, but the, uh, what really helps you to become proficient is experience. And I remember thinking, after I'd been in my squadron a few months, that suddenly I'm pushing buttons, changing radar modes without consciously thinking about it. And so I said, oh, okay, now I'm, now I'm here, now I'm fully functional. One of, the, uh, one of my most important missions was at the end of the flight, we would debrief, and then we would usually go to the officer's club and you know, we'd have a beer. And so one of my most important roles as a Rio was to loan my pilot 20 bucks, okay, at the club. <laughs> is anyone here a, a Navy fighter pilot? Is it, okay, does anybody know any Navy fighter pilots? If you know, okay, they're always trying to borrow money, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, one thing I can tell you is, I, and I, you guys look like a group that can keep a secret, but when the Navy, when the F-14 was new, the Navy explored using chimpanzees in the back seat. And so 
After a couple of months of intense training and testing, they found that the chimpanzees were able to handle the radar work. But the problem is the chimps kept losing the 20 bucks, <laughs> and so guys like me got the job to be a Rio. <laughs> Once I got into my fleet squadron, uh, after almost two years of training, after being graded, evaluated, closely supervised, it was great to, to join the squadron, to be flying in the airplane, and to go through all these dynamic uh, environments. <laughs> Low level, high speed, high altitude, multi-airplane dogfights, et cetera. Now, the responsibility increased because we no longer had an instructor pilot in the plane. I was with another fleet pilot and me, and we were responsible for the airplane, the mission, et cetera. But I had been well-trained. I was ready for it. I really enjoyed it. Of course, in addition to training for our mission, dogfighting, fleet air defense, we routinely perform carrier operations. This is an F-14 flying above the USS Ranger. We're at about 2,000 feet. And even though that carrier is more than 1,000 feet long, it looks small, even from this altitude. To give you a sense of the size of the flight deck, I prepared this graphic. Now, I did not actually land on a football field at any time, but I know some guys that could have pulled it off. So to make a safe landing on an aircraft carrier, an F-14 would have to touch down in the yellow rectangle. And I put it on the football field to give you a sense of how small the area is. You can see I've got the dimensions up there, 125 feet long, 56 feet wide. And remember, this carrier is going through the water at 20 to 30 miles an hour, bobbing up and down, Sometimes it's nighttime, you may be low on fuel, you may only have one engine, and you've got to land on that in that little rectangle, and you've got to do it safely. It was incredibly demanding flying, but the Navy trained its pilots and, and NFOs to do this consistently, safely, and reliably. And so they're out there doing it around the world, day and night, and it just happens. Uh, so it, it's an indication of the commitment and the training value. And again, remember, if you have any questions, something's not clear as I'm going through, raise your hand and, and I'll uh, go over it and, and explain it. <clears throat> About, yes? Your uh, picture of the football field, the round down on the back of the carrier, is that about the exact distance from the round down to where you can land the airplane? No, you know what, that's a good question. So the question is, is the round down on the carrier, which is the, the back of the carrier, the same distance as the end of the football field on this picture? That's something I did not think about when I was, built, when I was putting this together. Uh, and actually, the distance from the back of the carrier to the one wire is more than is shown here. So that if, you ex if I extended the flight deck, it would come to way, way back here, OK? But it's like that photo that I showed earlier. When you're coming in to land on the carrier, it looks like, I mean, the, the, the size of this stuff is small. And so even though you've got more than 100 feet of, of uh, safety area before you get to the cables, it doesn't look like very much. And the fact that the carrier's uh, about 70 feet above the water, you know, that's, that's not very high either. So the tolerances, the, uh, the dimensions, they're the minimum safe dimensions. And it take, takes a lot of training and constant attention to do this consistently. Yes? What speed did you land at? Oh, thanks. Good question. The landing speed of the F-14 was 134 knots. That was the base landing speed. It was a few knots uh, faster or slower, depending on weight. 134 knots is roughly 150 miles an hour. So several months, oh yes. I was curious, what was your first uh, recovery? Oh no, to, uh, when, you're, when you're training, uh, when I first went to the carrier, we had to do six day landings, and then uh, we'd do four night landings. That's your initial carrier qualification. So a few months after I joined VF-24, the squadron packed up everything. People, airplanes, tools, reference manuals, everything 
on the uh, USS Constellation, we left San Diego and we headed out towards the Indian Ocean for a seven and a half month deployment. Seven and a half months. Has anyone ever gone on a seven and a half month business trip? It, that's a long, oh, was it a Navy deployment? Well, there you go. So you know, if you haven't done something like that, it is a major mental shift to say, I'm going to be away from home for this long period of time. Now, this was in the 1980s. We had no email. So, you know, that was something that we weren't even thinking about. U.S. postage, U.S. mail took 10 days to get, uh, to get back to the States from the Indian Ocean. We had no television. Our movies were uh, old movies or, or second-run movies that, were, that the Navy provided to us. I mean, it really was an interesting, uh, an interesting way to operate. And this was peacetime. This was routine operations for the Navy. On the positive side, we did some incredibly interesting flying. And I'll tell you about that in, in the next couple of slides. And we also got to see these, uh, these great locations. Singapore, Perth, Australia, Mombasa, places some of them I had never heard of, and now here I am visiting them with uh, some of my good friends. As I mentioned, we did interesting flying. We, uh, we did a variety of practicing for real world missions. Some of the real world missions were defending the carrier, and that was actually quite boring uh, because we'd go up, we'd take station, we'd watch the radar, and we'd fly in orbit over an empty spot of the ocean. And we'd do that for as long as the exercise lasted. Sometimes there would be a, a plane come through that would be our target. And other times we'd just sit there. For me, I would sit in that jet and I would go, man, I'm bored, but I'm in an F-14 getting bored. So, you know, that helped make it worthwhile. But also, I remember I would sit there and I would play with the radar the whole time. I would dial the sensitivity all the way down, all the way up, and I would just sit there and play with that, and I think that helped, helped me become even more familiar with the radar. Of course, the more exciting flying was uh, when we would train against uh, other aircraft, either in the countries that we'd fly near them or other aircraft on the carrier. We'd do dogfight training. We'd occasionally launch missiles, things like that. A lot more exciting flying. and then. We also, when we got into a certain part of the world, we would run in, encounter Soviet airplanes. This was the height of the Cold War. The Soviets were definitely our geopolitical enemy, and they would send out airplanes to try to sneak up on our aircraft carrier. And so as the fighters, we would intercept them and escort them whenever they're in the vicinity of the carrier. One more thing, and I'll take your question. One of the good things about the Navy was it had an excellent program for bringing new people up, mentoring, training, supervising. And one of the basic things they did in a two-seat airplane like the F-14 was they would take a new pilot and they'd put him with a, a more experienced, older backseater or Rio. In my case, I was a new Rio, so I flew with an experienced pilot. And my pilot was the squadron commander. Okay, at this time I was about uh, 23 years old, like I said, I'd been in the squadron just a couple of months, and I'm flying with this guy who was almost 40. And so I'm thinking, wow, you know, should he even still be flying? You know, of course. <laughs> but he, he had had, he had, you know, almost 200 combat missions in Vietnam. He had been a Blue Angel. And, and as a squadron commander, he was the senior guy in the squadron. So talk about adult supervision. I had it. One thing that we did in the Navy was we traditionally call the squadron commander the skipper. And so I would call him skipper instead of commander, or of course I called him sir all the time. But, but that was a, uh, a good term, it was very convenient. So yes, do you have a question? Was the radar base all off the carrier? Is, it, off the carrier? is the what based off the carrier? Radar uh, which radar? We had an, a radar in the F-14. But uh, so the F-14, one of its great features, he said, is the radar based on the carrier. So I'll tell you what kind of radars we had. If we were training in the United States or out of San Diego, there were land-based radars that would watch our area and they would provide vectors. You know, they'd say, 
F-14s, we see you on your station and your target is over here and, and we'd, we have planned exercises to uh, fly and intercept them. If we're out on the aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean, the carrier had a very good radar and then uh, most of the other ships, especially the destroyers and the cruisers, the larger Navy ships, they had also very good air search radars. And so we would work with them and they could, uh, they could either sanitize the airspace and say, okay, we've got you know, an unknown contact out at 200 miles, so go intercept that guy. Or they could tell us, uh, we could do training exercises and they would control us. That was the surface-based radar. Of course, we also had the E-2 Hawkeye, which had a very powerful radar, and he would fly around. He could see more than 200 miles. He would help us. But the F-14, one of its features was it had a very good radar in the airplane. So does that answer your question, what you're thinking of? Okay. So we're flying around. The, we're, uh, we're, our ship is sailing from San Diego, crosses the Pacific, goes into the Indian Ocean, and then one day on uh, December 19th, 1981, a day I'll always remember, the, uh, the commanding officer and I were out flying a daytime training mission. It was a Saturday afternoon. It's about 5 p.m. We came back to the carrier. We landed. Everything was uh, totally normal until we touched down on the carrier. As soon as we touched down, we caught the cable there's four cables stretched across. You have to catch any one of them. We caught the cable. It slowed us down, and then it just let us roll free. This was a photo that was taken by a young sailor who didn't even realize what he was seeing. He was just observing flight ops because there was this place where you could go watch, and he had one of those little 110 cameras. Remember those? He took this picture of our airplane as we rolled down the flight deck. Now, what you can see is there's a cable trailing behind our plane. That's not supposed to be there. What happened was we caught the number four wire. The number four wire was not set correctly to the weight of our airplane. It has to be dialed to the weight of the airplane so the machinery is most efficient at stopping the plane. Our plane, when we landed, weighed 51,800 pounds. The number four wire was set for 14,000 pounds. We caught it, we went through that 14,000 pounds, all the valves and everything blew up, and then we just rolled down the flight deck. So we're rolling down the flight deck at about 50 miles an hour, 5-0. I'm sitting there, I had an incredible range of thoughts going through my brain. <laughs> oh, has anyone ever been in a car accident? Uh, you know, I hope not, but if you've been in a car accident, maybe you've experienced this time dilation, when things start happening, or your brain starts thinking of things. The problem was, I could not come to a decision. You know, do I need to eject? But I did realize that if I pulled the ejection handle, there was no going back. So as we get to the end of the flight deck, the pilot goes, eject, eject. Well, as soon as he said that first E, I knew what he was saying, so I pulled the handle. The plane went over the side, of the, of the carrier, the angle deck, and while it was falling, my seat came out, and I went straight up and started to come straight down. Luckily, I was out over the water because my parachute opened just before I hit the water. So I actually, I was, I was disappointed that I blacked out for about two seconds. The seat fired, I blacked out, and then I came to when my parachute opened up just before I splashed in the water. The plane continued to fall. The pilot seat came out next, and this is all an automatic sequence. The, the back seater goes first, then the pilot goes. And the plane had tilted to the left, and so his seat went out, and he splashed into the water without getting a parachute. Now, the people on the carrier flight deck who were watching this, they said he gave new meaning to the term skipper. <laughs> We, we can laugh about it because we both survived. So he goes like, whatever, you guys, you know, I'm here. No, in the F-14, uh, the question was, did I go through the canopy? That's a good question because it gives me a lead in. When you pull that handle, 
a very ingenious sequence of events happens. First thing is the canopy comes off. When the canopy is separate, gets six feet away from the plane, the back seat fires. Uh, I believe it's four tenths of a second later, the front seat fires. So when my seat fired, the seat knew that I was at low altitude because it has a barometer in there. And so as soon as it fired, it cut my straps, kicked me out of the seat, my parachute came out, and the parachute has a, a device to blow the canopy open. So, I mean, it was, this is a very well-designed seat, and I landed in the water with, with no injuries. So I landed in the water. It's uh, daytime. The water's warm. I have my automatic life preserver. So as soon as I got in the water, my life preserver inflated, and I popped up to the surface. This is all very, very good. I'm feeling, I'm, my brain is now just starting to realize what's going on. I look at the carrier going by. I was right next to the carrier. I see guys run over to the side. I give them a big thumbs up. And right away, there's a helicopter overhead. I'm, I mean, in seconds. And the reason is that there's always a helicopter around the carrier when there's flight ops. And our helicopter saw the plane go over and came right over to see me. I see the helicopter. He is, he is about as high as this ceiling. So he's not hundreds of feet up. He's like 40 feet up. I can make eye contact with him. I give him a thumbs up, and he flies away. I go, well, that's not what I meant, but you know. So what happens then is uh, what he did was he went to look at the pilot. So I go, OK, I got to get out of my parachute. I undid my straps. I start to back out of my parachute. In Pensacola, we had trained for this. What if you get in the water, you're surrounded by your parachute? I was calm. I start to back out of my parachute, but I was not getting away from it. They told us, don't cut yourself out, because if you cut those lines, then one line becomes two, and it, you may get more tangled up. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, you know, that sounded good in the pool in Pensacola, but <laughs> I'm tangled up. So I got my switchblade out, and, and through training, this is, another, this is another theme. You know, we train for this stuff all the time. So when I needed that switchblade, without even thinking, I just pulled it out. And our, our parachute technicians had a problem with the blades inadvertently popping open, so they duct taped them closed. So I'm floating in the water, trying to find the end of that duct tape with my thumbnail. And yeah, I know you're laughing. And you know, I was floating in the water, and I was laughing too. I was going like, this is so funny, you know? So, <laughs> anyway, so I, I peeled the tape, popped the blade open. It, it popped open. and. I was amazed. I mean, I still am amazed by this. I took that knife, and I just took one swipe, and the blades just, I mean, and the lines just like parted, and I go, it was sharp. So I go, that's good, you know, this is good. So the, uh, the helicopter flies back. Because they had flown to my pilot, he, he saw that I was still tangled up in my parachute. He comes back, and he drops the cable with the, uh, with the harness on it, drags it over to me. I wrap myself up. And they start to pull me up. I've got some lines on me. They put me back down in the water. I grab the lines, take another cut, and then they pull me up. And you know, I'm standing here telling you this, but, but thinking back on it, it was just such an experience because, I mean, it was, it was like cheating death. And that's why the subtitle of my book says cheating death. But I mean, to think back on this, I am in the water, tangled in my parachute, and, and this guy just pulls me out of mortal peril, you know. So they pull me up in the parachute. I mean, they pull me up in the helicopter. And uh, I get in there. I, I'm feeling great. And I hear the helicopter guys go, we lost the pilot. And I go like, oh, God. I'm thinking, I just killed the skipper. And so what they really meant was they lost sight of him. And they go, there he is, there he is. OK, so we go over and pick him up. They put a swimmer in the water, get him wrapped up, and they bring him up in, in the harness and bring him up. We land back on the carrier, and they said, hey, Dave, they go, you didn't know this, but we did not put a swimmer in the water for you because we could see your parachute was starting to get tangled or dragged under by the wake of the ship, and we needed to get you out of there as soon as possible. And I go, that, that's good. I was glad I didn't know that at the time because <laughs> So they, they pulled us, uh, 
we got all dried off. We we're doing the pilot had a fracture uh, in his neck, vertebrae, but he was med down for 30 days, did not fly. But then he returned to 100% ops, and he and I, you know he and I are both we we still see each other sometimes and stuff like that. We both did fine. So this experience raised my profile in the squadron, but because we wrote articles, we gave some talks on the carrier, but I realized I could not make a career out of being a crash test dummy. So I stepped up my, my efforts to uh, become an expert in certain parts of the F-14, and then a few months later, uh, partly as a result of that, I was selected to attend the Top Gun class as a student. Now this is something that it's hard to have this as a goal because it's, it's almost random how you get selected, but for me to attend this thing, I'm thinking like, man, this is, this is just keeps getting better. You know, after selected to fly F-14, surviving an ejection, then I go to Top Gun. Well, Top Gun was known within aviation circles at the time. This was in 1982, before the movie. Not a lot of people outside of aviation knew about it. It was known as some of the best flying you could have in your career. And as soon as I walked into that classroom, uh, I, I saw the reason, I learned the reason why they had the reputation they did. And that's because their, their lectures were incredibly professional. The instructors seemed to know everything about their topic. They could answer any question we asked. And then we climbed into the airplanes and went out and fought these guys, and they were great. I mean, so not only are they great lecturers, but they were great fighter pilots and Rios. We were flying the big F-14s, the big jets. They were flying uh, small, maneuverable, nimble uh, jets like the F-5 and the A-4 Skyhawk, if people are uh, familiar with airplanes. The Top Gun class lasted for five weeks. Uh, it was, as expected, some of the best flying in my entire Navy career. And then I went back to my uh, fleet squadron. And, and I can talk a little bit more about it now, but I'll tell you more about Top Gun in just a moment. So I went back to my squadron, and after a couple of months, I said, I wonder if I could be a Top Gun instructor when I, when I leave this squadron. And so I started looking into that, and uh, things fell into place. And then I was selected to be a Top Gun instructor. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm jumping over some stuff, but what really happened was back then, in, uh, in 1982, 83, if you did well in the Top Gun class, you got put on the list and you would, could get invited back to be an instructor. And so the, the pilot that I flew with in the class, he and I both did well, and we both got invited back, and we both went back to be instructors. So, after another deployment in F-14s, I had to wait, you know, till it was my turn. I reported to Top Gun as an instructor, and this is a picture of me uh, briefing a Top Gun class flight. So when I showed up, I learned the secret behind their reputation. It's two simple words, hard work. To, uh, to get qualified to, be, to give one of the Top Gun class lectures, it's a very uh, complicated uh, preparation process, called, and it's called a murder board is your qualification. And what you have to do is not only know all the details about your subject, but you have to know how it fits in with other relevant subjects. I talked about F-14 intercept procedures. I had to know about the missiles, and there was a separate missile lecture, but I had to know where our lectures intersected and mention that and stuff. And then we also had uh, presentation standards. So when you're a Top Gun instructor, we had a podium, but you never stood behind the podium. You stood to the side of the podium. You, you could not stand with your arms crossed. You couldn't stand with your hands in your pockets. You could never do that. What you, what you had to do is be careful with your hands. One thing that you could, could do was you could do this. We call this the spider on the mirror because it looks like a spider on the mirror. You could also stand, sometimes touch the podium, as long as you didn't lean on it. Something else that we had to do was whenever we wrote on the whiteboard, we had to write neatly. Now, all these rules were put there by guys who had flown combat in Vietnam. Some of them had shot down enemy airplanes. A couple of them were aces, which means they had shot down five airplanes. And these rules were set in place, not as harassment for new instructors, but to, to minimize distraction and to allow the class to focus on 
the content. Okay, so for standardized presentation, get maximum value out of it. As instructors, we taught the class about their airplanes, their weapon system, their tactics. We also taught them about enemy airplanes and tactics. And then when we flew against them, we flew smaller airplanes, A4 Skyhawk, single seat F5E, two seat F5F, which is the plane I flew. Because as a backseater, I was flying in the backseat of the F5F. Now these planes, inferior to the F-14 overall. But they could challenge the F-14 where F-14 crews needed it most, and that is the close-in dogfighting and also intercept procedures. As a Top Gun instructor, we flew very challenging flights, complex missions. We were responsible for the safety and conduct of the entire flight, the students, uh, they're learning, you know, what they learned, et cetera. But the Top Gun program is very good about bringing instructors along. A couple of things that they do is the standards are explicitly stated. You know, there were not a bunch of rules that weren't enforced. If there was a rule at Top Gun, it was enforced. They also, like in being in a fighter squadron, they have a good culture of mentoring, bringing new instructors along. Because by the time you get there as an instructor, they want to see you succeed. So they're happy to have you on the team, but, and they'll help you earn your way, but you've got to earn your way on the team. For me, it was very rewarding, um, and, and just uh, I, was, I was happy to be a part of that group. In addition, as you've seen, see I took all these pictures, we, we did some great flying, and I got the opportunity to take even more, you know, pictures. This is a guy uh, inverted in the Sierra Nevadas. And that picture on the bottom right, I don't know exactly how low we were, but we were really low. We were going about probably 350 knots, something like that. Just great flying. A few, uh, let's say about a year after I joined the Top Gun Squadron as an instructor, a black limousine came onto NAS Miramar. And had a couple of movie producers, director of photography, some writers, and they started talking about making a movie. They had seen an article in California Magazine that was about two guys going through the Top Gun class. The article had these great photos taken by a former Top Gun instructor, and the movie producers, Don Simpson and Jerry Brookheimer, said this would make a great movie. So they did their homework, they got some approval in Washington, D.C., then they came to Miramar to, to uh, work on the details of it. That movie, of course, became Top Gun. This is a picture I took when we were flying to uh, film scenes for the movie. White Learjet at the top, flown by uh, Clay Lacey, legendary air racer, businessman, and pilot. He had the cameras in there. They took two of our, or they took four of our F-5s and painted them black to act as the enemy airplanes in the movie. Here's another picture. This is Clay Lacey's Learjet in the front with uh, the plane supposedly flown by Maverick. Now, when I took this picture, I, I didn't even notice that glare, but the uh, camera plane was so, uh, they, were, they were saying, hey, no distractions, don't do anything. So I had to sneak my camera up, take this picture, and put it away. And so the only reason I keep it is because it's such a rare picture. Um, to have that picture of the, of the, F5, of the F-14 and the Learjet. <clears throat> While we're filming the movie, we learned a couple of things about the, uh, the movie people. They were very, they were uh, talented in their, specific, uh, in their specific area. They were committed to success. Uh, I don't know, has anyone here ever worked with Hollywood people or making a movie or anything like that? Okay, what you probably hear about Hollywood people is, you know, the, the fantastic stories in the news about weird behavior, and that's what makes the news. But the people involved in making a movie, they're professional, and they want to make a good movie. They also list, they asked us for our opinion, and then they, on certain matters, they respected our experience, and they used our advice whenever they could. I mean, now the movie is not a documentary, that's for sure. But it's a pretty good movie, and there's certain things in there that, uh, that we all contributed as instructors. At the end of the movie, uh, we had a cast and crew party. 
where we, uh, we got to take our families, girlfriends, whatever, and we met the actors and the cameramen and stuff like that. And this is a picture of my wife and me with Tom Cruise. So this is me over here on the left, and this is Tom Cruise on the right, okay? <laughs> that was me over there. And, that's, and my wife's in the middle, of course. We had no idea that Top Gun would uh, become the, the cultural icon that it has. I mean, here we are almost 30 years later. It came out in 1986, it was the number one movie of 86, and 30 years later it's still on TV and people are still talking about it. The reason I put this picture up here is because I'm pretty sure that's me in the back seat of the F5. Because we went out there and we flew next to the Learjet and they said, you know, act surprised and all that. <clears throat> now, I rolled up my sleeves on my black flight suit. They, they gave us black helmets, black flight suits, so we would all look the same. And there were four Rios at Top Gun. And I rolled up my sleeves because I go, I want to make sure that's me. And so before we started filming, the Learjet comes up and goes, uh, Rio in the F5, put your sleeves back down. <laughs> that was, that's a special effects shot also. They, they tried a couple of times to get an F-14 that close, uh, but th they could not do it safely. So they said, okay, we can do this. One of the few special effects shots. In preparation for the movie, they had writers go around Miramar and they asked us for inputs and stuff. This was actually, do you remember when Goose said this in the movie? This was actually something that I said to a pilot on a flight. And so when I was talking to the writers, I go, hey, I said watch the mountains one time. And so they used that. They used, uh, but a lot of the other things uh, were things that people said or they were based on things that people said. When the movie was, uh, was, when it was done filming, a pilot and I went up to Paramount for two days and we helped them to put the flying scenes together and write the dialogue for flying. And that was fascinating to work with them again uh, up in Paramount. They told us that the credits were too long. They would not have our names in the credits. But then when the movie came out, uh, we were watching the credits and, and we saw our names. And we go, okay, that's pretty good. So immortalized, you know, on the big screen. <clears throat> All right, I didn't mean to do that. After two and a half years, or at two and a half years, which is the standard length of a tour for a Top Gun instructor, I had to rotate out, make room for some new guys, and I returned to my beloved F-14. I got sent back to another F-14 squadron, made uh, two more deployments. I just put this picture in here for airplane enthusiasts. It shows something that the uh, Navy did. In the early part of the 80s, we had these glossy gray airplanes, and uh, later they painted uh, low visibility gray. You cannot hide an F-14. I mean, it's more than 60 feet long. But what we did see is that that low visibility gray, it was, it was good at, at making the plane less visible when it's like five or six miles away or further. And that's, that's a key you know, distance. If you're in a combat situation, you're fighting against somebody and, the, and they don't know exactly where you are and they're trying to visually acquire you, it, it could help you in that situation. Yes? Let me tell you, Art Scholl, yeah. No. Okay, the question was about uh, Art Scholl, who was a uh, famous air show pilot. He's got a, a, a lot of material on him on the internet because he flew the air show circuit for a long time, did a great uh, air acrobatic, aerobatic display. And he uh, was flying in support of the movie Top Gun with his pits with a camera on it. And I think what they were doing was trying, he was going out in a spin and they were filming the horizon spinning around. I think that's what they were doing. And he went out for uh, the day he was filming this, he went out for a third flight and he radioed, I've got a problem or something like that. And then he crashed. He was never, you know, and he died, he was killed. And I was, uh, I was in Paramount the day that he was killed and when that call came in. And we were just sitting there going like, we were stunned because we had all heard of him. I mean, even me, I, didn't, I hadn't met the guy, but, and so that's just the price, you know, he just, his time was up.
So he, he was killed making the movie. And they don't know exactly why. So one thing that the, uh, we did in our F-14s was we started painting them dark, something else. And uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting towards the end, so if you have questions, we will have some uh, time to answer questions uh, when I'm done talking, but uh, you might want to formulate your questions. But something else the Navy did was they invested in high performance, very challenging adversaries like these uh, F-16s. And this is an F-14, you'll notice if you look closely, it's got camouflage paint. In that squadron, the pilots and Rios went out and painted that plane, those planes ourselves. We talked to maintenance, we got watercolor paint, and they said, you guys can paint them yourselves. And so we, we did that, and it was really cool to man up an airplane that was painted like that. You know, it just felt like you're manning up a war machine. Uh, two and a half years, or about two and a half years in that squadron, uh, I loved getting back to the F-14, the giant afterburners and, you know, all the great flying. And then I had to do a desk job. I, I worked for the uh, joint staff in the Pentagon. That's all I'm going to say about that, just because I mean, it wasn't secret. It's just like we don't want to talk about that here. And then after a few years of desk jobs, I was very fortunate and honored to, to be selected to command an F-14 squadron and I returned back to uh, VF-211, the fighting checkmates. And uh, we flew missions over Operation Southern, or for Operation Southern Watch in Iraq. Now by this time, the F-14 was carrying bombs also, a whole new mission set, and so we were a, a real strike fighter. And these airplanes, we have cluster bombs uh, mounted on the belly. In 1999, I retired from the Navy, so, you know, flying a desk again. And then uh, one night while I was driving home from work, I thought, I'm going to write a magazine article about making the movie Top Gun. And then after just a few minutes, I go, no, I'm going to write a book about it. So I talked to my wife, and she goes, yeah, go ahead, you know. So she encouraged me, really. and. Uh, and it took a couple of years, and then I, my book came out, and my book is called Top Gun Days. Now, my literary agent came up with this uh, subtitle, Dog Fighting, Cheating Death, and Hollywood Glory, and all that. He said, Dave, you've got to have something snappy on the title. I go, OK, that's fine. But, but the book talks about what it was like. Uh, basically, it's what I've told you here, what it's like being a new guy in a fighter squadron, going to Top Gun as a student, an instructor, and making the movie. And uh, I do have copies here. They're uh, museum books, so the uh, sale, sales benefits the museum. And I'm out there, and I'll be happy to autograph them for you. So what I'm thinking about, though, is since writing the book, I've been uh, fortunate. I get to talk to uh, groups of aviation enthusiasts. I've told you some of my lessons, you know, the value of training, teamwork, mentoring, et cetera. And, and I also hope that, uh, that you get a sense that I, I felt like I was very fortunate to uh, have experienced what I, what I did experience, and in some cases, to even survive. So what I'd like to do now, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to answer your questions. Uh, believe me, there are no dumb questions. And if you have a question, other people probably have it. And the last thing I'd like to say is, Tomcats forever. So thank you for your attention.